This is The Extra Point, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast, sponsored by your Phoenix Suns. Well, the NBA draft is Wednesday. When you think about like the, the media draft here in the great state of Arizona in the Valley of the Sports, there, there are a couple people that I think would be a top five pick worth trading up for. Uh, definitely... You know, worth uh, giving up like uh, Marquise Chris and a Dragon Bender for maybe more. Let's bring him in now. The one, the only, uh, 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 just a voice that goes with the Phoenix Suns. Kellen Olson joins us from Arizona Sports. And man, it's been a while since we've heard your voice. How are you doing? I'm doing well, man. I'm more of an undrafted free agent. I need to work my way through. Like I'm, I'm on the Josh Hart path, like my third or fourth team. And all of a sudden I'm pumping up the fans in Madison Square Garden. Found my home, found my people. That's more of my route, but I appreciate uh, the comparison. Thank you. Well, when you think about just the rocket ship ride that you have gone on since the Jay Triano days and and getting your start at Arizona Sports, what has your journey been like to, I'm just going to say it, ex-stardom? Is that okay if I say X stardom? Can you, that maybe that's that's the wrong connotation? But go ahead. Hey, if you like <laughs> obscure wrestling and television <laughs> tweets and like me tweeting like six times, pissed off about the U.S. men's national team, yeah, I'll, I'm a star in that way. Sure, sure thing, Mark. Uh, it's been amazing. I'm extremely grateful for the opportunities that I've been given. I, you know, my routine at a Suns game, I'll go out there and sit on the court before a game. And then uh, before we talk to the coaches and after the coaches, I'll try and get out there too, if I can between work. And those are my little moments just to be like, Hey man, I don't know if I'm going to be at a game tomorrow. I'm going to be able to sit on the court and watch Devin Booker, LeBron James, Kevin Durant warm up. You know, it's, it's a really special thing. And it goes back to, it was just as special as it was 20 win season as, as it is now. I know it's corny to say, but that's really how it is for me to be able to cover the league. So I'm really excited for all the opportunities that uh, come with it. Like I'm going to Vegas in two weeks to cover Team USA training camp and talk to Book and KD. I never thought I would be able to do that ever. Uh, so it's been it's been awesome, man. I think they look forward to what you're going to ask. I think they read all of your stuff. Maybe they would never say it, but they think you do a great job. We do too here. So thanks for all the time. Um, let's get right to it. And uh, with the 22nd pick, it here, uh, pick here in the NBA draft, who who do you think the Suns will draft? If I had to pick one guy right now, oh, man, that's interesting. Like I could go chalk and just say Tyler Kolek, right? Like that's the most popular thing to say right now, the Marquette. Point guard. Uh, I'll go with Eve Missy out, out of Baylor. I'll pick. I'll pick the Baylor center. Uh, I think the interesting thing about this draft mark that we're going to get into is not only how important the pick is to the Suns and what they're going to do, but it's also important to fill a need. But when we look at the needs, Mark, we've got point guard, we've got wing, and we've got center. And if you think about today's NBA, we don't really have power forwards. I guess guys are shooting guards in some ways, but. We've basically got three positions on the floor now. So it is all three positions that they need to fill in some type of way. Uh, with Missy, I think the dynamic that you would be bringing from an athleticism perspective would be just a huge boost. And the upside that he has is really tantalizing. He just started playing organized basketball when he was 16. So when you see him on defense and he's in the right, wrong spot and he needs some coaching as a freshman, you understand it, one, because Baylor was a phenomenal defensive team and they've been a phenomenal defensive program for a decade now. But you look at the upside that he has with how he moves around the floor, not someone who's going to be your hub as a playmaking center, not someone who's going to shoot threes anytime soon, but he's a real vertical athlete in the way that he gets up and down the floor and the way that he can be a lob threat. And you you know how I've handled the use of Nurkic thing this year. He has been a guy under immense scrutiny and rightfully so with some of the weaknesses in his game. But with that being said, I think he brings a lot of positives, but the positives he brings aren't the two things that matter the most right now for a center, which is hitting threes, or being a lob threat. Those are the two ways you put pressure on the offense the most. We're in a pick and roll league, Mark. The guy setting the pick is the center. So having a guy who can do one of those two things would be huge. And uh, I like the kid out of Baylor. It's the right mix of helping them right now, but also getting some long-term upside on what is their most valuable asset right now this offseason. Well, and, and I look at, I think James Jones' best draft pick ever was Cam Johnson and somebody who who really was able to shine um, I think I'm getting that right with Cam Johnson. Feel free to rip me if that's wrong. But a guy who was able to show he can play and came in and, and, and could play. And you just look at the draft. I mean, there was going back to uh, Dayron Sharp. Where is he now? Jalen Smith, KZ, Ak- Akpala, Jarrett Culver, George King, Elia Kobo, Zaire Smith. Then we get to DeAndre Aiden. 
how many guys can actually impact uh, the, the NBA that, that could hear their names called on Wednesday and Thursday? Well, well, that's the really interesting thing. Someone that I'd really like in this draft and particularly looking at it through the lens of the Suns as a contender is Terrence Shannon Jr. out of Illinois. He was recently found not guilty of rape and aggravated assault. It was something that was rightfully so dominating the discourse in his draft stock right now. But after he got that figured out in the courtroom, and, and I encourage everyone to go read up on it to figure out more details and find out where you land on it. But with that, looking at it on the basketball court with Shannon, he is one of the five or six guys in this class, in my opinion, above all else, who are ready for NBA minutes right now. And I think, Mark, they're not really going to care as much about upside or utilizing this for value's sake, like I was talking about with Missy earlier. I think the main thing they care about is finding a rotation player for next season with this pick, not a guy who could be a starter in three years or could be a starter by the end of the season. I think they want quality minutes. So look, if you think Tyler Kolek can give you a dozen to 18 really good backup point guard minutes right now, and you don't care if he's not the starter in three or four years and you use a first round pick on a, a backup point guard, then do it. You know, they, that's what's going to be the most important to them right now with this pick in, in the short term. I do think there's the right way to approach using the asset, like I said, uh, but Shannon is another guy. He's an absolute blur in transition was maybe the best or not maybe was the best downhill score in college basketball and is the best downhill slasher in this draft took almost nine free throws a game and he can shoot there are so many prospects mark you're going to be watching this uh espn telecast and under weaknesses it's going to be jump shot for about half of these guys selected in the first round wow there are so many unproven commodities that can't shoot especially on the wing in this draft shannon can shoot uh colorado's tristan de silva is another guy that can shoot but shannon's a high tier athlete and can defend multiple positions and in a lockdown manner at times. There were times where his focus waned from Illinois to Texas Tech uh, with his transition into becoming one of the best players in the country. But I thought that he was fantastic. And I think that he's a guy that is now finding his way into those 20s ranges where he was maybe a second round pick before this off court stuff that he was dealing with that I mentioned earlier. And now he's a guy that could be available in the 20s. And that's what I keep thinking about with this pick and, and the Suns who can help them right now. It's guys like Kolek and it's guys like Terrence Shannon for sure. Well, you know, and Alvin Gentry used to always say the easiest thing to fix is a jump shot. And you look at Derek Jones Jr. And if I had told you four or five years ago he would be playing big minutes in the NBA Finals and hitting jump shots, um, I'm wondering what you would have told me. Do you, do you subscribe to the theory that if a guy's athletic, you can teach him to shoot? I subscribe to the theory that if you interview the kid and you believe the kid is going to work at his jumper and is has the – um the makeup to break through a wall if that makes sense then they're going to be able to do it because i think that the, the the most difficult thing with a jumper is one shooting it because you saw josh Akogi over times in the last two seasons was not a guy who was perennially known as a good shooter and he was a below average shooter but what really hurt that mark wasn't when he was shooting and missing it was when he was getting the ball and hesitating a little bit and young players a lot and, and josh is a well-seasoned pro at this point not calling him a young player but younger players, um, I think of Ryan Dunn out of Virginia. He's a guy I think you're going to be hearing about a lot with the Suns. Recently, our own John Gambador on Burns and Gambo just reporting that he's someone that they're interested in and could, and could be a possibility with number 22. But he's a guy that you watch, and he catches the ball, and he hesitates, Mark. He sits there and kind of thinks about if he's going to shoot it or not. There are reports this week that he killed it in workouts, and he shot the ball really well. Um, I hate to do the old head, I'm on the – fortune i'm upset about something but i don't care if you can shoot a jumper in an empty gym mark how about thirty thousand fans screaming when the guy's closing out to you a six foot ten Kawhi leonard is closing out on you can you take that jumper then and that's where i saw on tape with him that he hesitated a lot and, and that is the type of thing with this jump shot where you're gonna have to look at it but yeah man it's gonna be a huge thing on draft on zachary reese shea alex sar um, the, just a few of the guys that can even shoot it. I mentioned to Silva and Shannon Dalton connect out of Tennessee is another established player who can shoot it. Reed Shepard out of Kentucky, but every other perimeter player that you're going to be seeing get their name called on draft night that I didn't mention have a shooting upside. He has the <laughs> chance, the ability. And it's like, man, this is the most important thing in our league right now. If you're a perimeter guy or even a big, can you shoot it? And we're in a weird class where a lot of those guys are, in that range but it's it's a great benefit for the sun's mark honestly because everyone looks at this draft and says it sucks rightfully so it sucks at the top if you're the atlanta hawks it sucks uh it doesn't suck for teams like the suns that are in the 20s well by the way um I'll get off my lawn rants are encouraged here on the extra point podcast so feel free to do that again um 
Who who do you think would be better in twenty years? Wimby, um, Zachary Richard. I, I'm not saying with that French, a French accent. Richache. So. Richache. 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 Sorry, I'm doing an Italian thing. Oh, there we go. Kid. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> mixing up my European countries. But he is from France, like Mr. Wembenyama. And Sar is, is Sar from France, or what's is, is he? Is there a, he ended they're up in of, France? They're of French origin. Yes. <laughs> Raise it that way. Yes. I, who um, knew France exactly would? Sure. Who knew that like France would take over the NBA? This is like the Beatles, right? Hey, Mark, th these aren't my problems now. You know, the Suns are in the playoffs. I don't give a crap about these guys now. At all. <laughs> no offense to them. They seem great, but I'm not breaking down Frank Nielakino or Jonathan Isaac. You know, I'm good now. Uh, not my problem. What was your first draft? Did you Were you there for the whole Dragon Bender, Marquise Chris thing, or did you show up? Hold on. I had the whole list. I had the whole I list. Wasn't, I wasn't Reed, there. Davon Reed, Alec Peters. Oh, Davon Reed. I love Davon Reed out of Miami. He was it, he was Mr. Irrelevant. He got that tattooed on his hand, right? Uh, other A different guy. Davon okay. Reed was like a high second round pick. He was one of those guys where they were pretty optimistic about him. He, you want a 45 second Davon Reed career story? Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm going to look up who I'm thinking of. Yes. Go ahead. Well, to your question on the first draft I covered, the first uh, story that I wrote that got like published somewhere that people read it besides like the nine friends and family who wrote uh, wrote, uh, read my blog back when I was in college, was on uh, Bright Side of the Sun. Um, the great Dave King pushed a, like, what? why is Zach Levine a lottery prospect? So Zach Levine now, who is in his 30s, I think, was the first prospect that I wrote about I remember covering with the draft. Wow. That's uh, that's going back. All right, I just had my guy, and I, I hold on. Just give me one second here because I, ha I have to pay this off. The guy who had the... The the Mister Irrelevant tattoo and I just lost it. I'm gonna come back to it. Mr. Uh, Isaiah Thomas was Mister Irrelevant. No, this was uh, this is how this, I'm mixing up like 2007 and 2017. That's the problem here. So this it's is a, this is a great segment of the show, by the way. If you're it's watching, it's a this. good slant to own. Like it's a good corner to take a hold of. It was. Oh my god. Okay, so Taylor Griffin was in 2000. It was Dwayne Collins. That's who I'm thinking of. And oh. I tweeted it, and it went crazy because he got Mister Irrelevant tattooed. So uh, Look at that. put that Taylor put, Griffin. Hopefully. Yes. Speaking of Bronny James, here's <laughs> yes. another. Yeah. There's your transition. Thank Mark. you. Thank you. you. Yes. Go ahead. Ask me about Bronny James. Uh, how surprised, uh, I guess, how, what would be your reaction if the Suns drafted Bronny James with the 22nd overall pick? I would be absolutely floored. Uh, it, it's not because Bronny doesn't have talent as an NBA prospect. I think that you're not going to believe this, Mark, but in our day and age our society today of sports analysis you either have to be on one plane or the other right you either have to say Bronny is horrible and the only reason he's been anything in his life is because of his father or Bronny is going to be great because his father was great uh Bronny is an NBA prospect but he is an NBA prospect in the way of getting drafted in the back half of the second round makes sense uh for him he went through a really rough season had that cardiac arrest incident where we didn't even know he was going to play basketball again that USC team, you saw a fair bit of an impact to a play mark. It was horrible. 15 and 18. They had a ton of talent. They should have been a top three, four team in the conference. They weren't. But when it comes to Bronny James, look, I I hate to it, pull this type of card, but to your question on like my level of experience covering the draft, I've been doing this now for over a decade and know how these things go. I know how guys will work out with certain teams, won't work out with others, how they will sort of try and dictate where they are, how they'll have certain things come out about what they do, but certain things won't come out. You get my medicals, you don't get my medicals, so on and so forth. Rich Paul doing this with Bronny James, he does it with 15 guys a year, but because it was Bronny James and because it was the Los Angeles Lakers and the Phoenix Suns working out LeBron James' son, when LeBron James said, I would like to play with my son one day, here we are. So here we are talking about it and, uh, I feel for the kid because he's actually a talented basketball player. Again, he's ranked in the 40s and the 50s for a reason. I understand it, but he's a talented basketball player. And I hope for his sake that he all of this was for a reason um, that's going to help him. So if he lands in the right situation where he goes to a Phoenix Suns in the second round or a Los Angeles Lakers team in the second round that is going to spend the time to develop him, then that's great. If he goes to Charlotte or Orlando, and just toils away on the bench and doesn't get the proper attention that he deserves as a prospect and gets developed properly, that's why I have a concern. And where I think the identification for Rich Paul and what they were trying to do, at least, were looking for franchises that would develop him. There you go. There's your eloquent LeBron -y James answer. You don't get a second one, Mark. It's only one. Well, then I'll ask you about LeBron. That was well put, by the way. Uh, Thank you. 
Uh, so if Bronny James were to come here, and we've already answered the question, what that, why that would be, why that would work. Um, how many, how many stories do you think you would write about would LeBron join him at some point um, here in Phoenix if LeBron were a member of the Phoenix Suns organization? I think it would just be the one, and the one would be about how something cooler than three million dollars is fifty-one million dollars. Like, <laughs> I don't care if you're a mega billionaire. I don't care if you have forty billion dollars, let alone six or whatever. LeBron James has. By the way, um, you know who knows if LeBron James would do that money-wise, like make a financial decision. Him, like no one else on the planet except him. Like not even the people closest to him in his life. He's really the only person that would know if he would make that kind of decision, honestly. So. I'm not going to be the person to speculate on that. Um, I will say LeBron James is a tremendous NBA basketball player, even at this stage. So any team getting him on the minimum at all should do it. I don't care who you have. I don't care about, look, it is. I think from LeBron's perspective, it's a bad idea because he barely touched the ball and he should have the ball. So either him or Kevin Durant's going to be off the ball a ton. Devin Booker still exists. These are things he'd have to figure out that don't, it don't, doesn't make sense to him. I don't care. From the sun's perspective it makes sense but yeah and i, and I just and, and thank you thank you for putting up with our our tabloid journalism here um I, I just look at the suns and the lakers and just think if you're if you're signing back up these two teams are walking into training camp going what's what's going to change what's going to be different maybe there's some steps forward for the suns but it does seem like more of a not total roster makeover but i mean big changes need to happen here and you know, we've seen big changes in the past. Do you expect, and this is asking you to speculate, um, when it comes to the rest of the summer, how busy do you think, do you think the Suns will be at remaking the roster here? Yeah, well, the interesting thing, Mark, and I saw our friend Joe Borgay at PHNX tweeting about this, and it's been something that uh, we've been talking about in Arizona sports as well, as I'm sure that Gerald and PHNX have been for a while now, and how dumb of an idea this second apron was for the league, because this is a league that drives off of, as you said, speculation. You know what's easy to speculate is trades, but now there are only a certain amount of trades that are legal. You've got a second apron team potentially working with a first apron team. Uh, the I know a few people listening don't really understand the rules specifically, but essentially what it does is restrict your ability to make trades. I can go on with the ways it restricts you, but the bottom line is it becomes really difficult to make trades. I think that if the Suns weren't under these restrictions, they would be taking the 22nd overall pick and a player or just that pick itself and trading it for a player that could help them win right now, a veteran that could help them win right now. But if you're trading Yusuf Nurkic and the 22nd pick for a player, it has to be a player that makes just a little bit less money than Yusuf Nurkic. I'm talking a million or two. That's it. It can be two players, but now you got to add two salaries together. You can't add a second player to make the salaries match. What kind of player are you getting for $15 million, $14 million? Hey, Mark, guess what? If it's not a center, you need a starting center now. How are you going to get a starting center? You can sign one for veterans minimum and free agency, or you can trade Nasir Little for one, but now you is there a starting center out there that makes $6 million? Like it's these restrictions continue to come into play where it's just so difficult and that applies when we're talking about the big fishes like Devin Booker like Kevin Durant like Bradley Beal I don't think that let's say you give me the best case Kevin Durant offer you give me three rotation players right now you're giving me one really good one and two pretty serviceable ones like you're you're making me a deeper team and I'm giving you the star are we talking about the old Suns teams again? Are we just talking about Devin Booker and a bunch of pretty good to solid players again? I've already seen that. No, thank you. Pass. <laughs> I'm done. I don't want to see that again. Uh, so with no offense to any of those players and what their abilities are and what they could be capable of, but I'm sitting there and I'm talking to guys like you and Nick King and I'm like, okay, let me get this straight. So Devin Booker is having one of the best post seasons of all time ever. Like he's on this incredible run and we're in game three. And we're talking about Jamal Murray and they can't stop him. And you're telling me that Devin Booker is the best option to guard that guy on top of everything else that he's doing. He has to guard him too. Like this is the type of stuff that they ran into previously when as far as playoff performance, once Chris was unfortunately getting hurt, that second star was gone. And we just saw it was a limited version of Chris Paul and, and then Devin Booker trying to do the heroics. He did his best, but I'm not interested in seeing that now. 
Mark, let's talk in 12 months. Let's do this on June 24th of next year and let's see where we're at. I think that's when it becomes a lot more interesting because the story of this off season for every team, at least in the Western Conference, is going to be what can we do to separate ourselves from this nine, 11 teams? And you can go as low as saying, make sure we're out of the play-in to make sure we make it out of the second round. I don't think there's, I think there's only going to be two or three teams in the West that can for sure say we are absolutely favorites to make it out of the first round right now. It's probably going to be OKC. It's probably going to be Minnesota. It's probably going to be Denver. The rest of the team is going to be like, man, conference finals would be great. <laughs> like it's just, it's going to be a war to get out of there. It's going to be a mess. And the Suns are in that type of difficult position. So again, we'll see where they're at next year. I think next year is when the fireworks really explode or uh, before the trade deadline, if things really go wrong, but I don't think they're going to, I think they're going to win a bunch of games with Bud. I think Bud's an excellent coach, especially in the regular season. They're going to win a whole lot of games this year. Playoffs come around. Don't know what's going to happen. I have no idea. Well, and that's we're here for it on Arizona's family uh, because you have to watch every night and you have to see what Kellen writes over on Arizona Sports. Um, could could Chris Paul help the situation if he were asked back to to play in for the Suns once again? I guess asked sure, back, but offered goes, a contract. Sure, but it goes back to my same problem. We're like, what's greater than three million dollars? Nine million dollars? Like I like I like the Spurs offering me fourteen million dollars a year to go be Wemby's point guard for two years. You know what I mean? Like I just think that Chris at this stage of his career kind of went under the radar because of what Golden State was going through, but also how Golden State kind of went away from the forefront of attention of the league and just how they were being broken down as a team. Chris had a pretty good year. Like he did not toil away in this bench role and prove to be to a point where the veterans minimum is now his value. Now, will Chris take the best basketball option? I think that absolutely he will. But the best basketball option is at this stage of his career might just be, hey, I'm going to do what Ricky Rubio did for Devin Booker. I'm going to help ascend the one of the next great elite talents of this league, and that is going to be how I decide this in my career. I don't expect Chris to do that, to be fair. I will be shocked, Mark, if he is not on a team that has a chance to win a title. Like it's, You were around Chris long enough, like me. He, he wants to win. That's it. Everything is about winning with him, and I would just be absolutely shocked. So let's say the options dry up and the Suns offer him a minimum deal, and he would take it. Yeah, he would help a lot of what they're looking for. I think organization, leadership, accountability was a big thing last year. That accountability, how much did we talk about that but the opposite when we were talking about him and Jay and Monty? Like how much they kept everyone accountable constantly? We were never asking if it was there. Um, that's where he would help for sure in the intangibles department alone. Then you look at on court, getting everyone organized, keeping the ball moving, get, making sure everyone's in the right stuff, they're running the right sets. Chris would be perfect, but I just don't think he's going to be an option for them. Because it's Chris Paul, he's still going to get a mid-level veterans. But this is where it gets weird, Mark, because we've got all these second apron teams now. So there are other teams like the Suns where if Chris Paul wants to join a contender, that's great. Most of them are in the second apron, so you can only sign for the minimum. Now you're competing with other teams on the minimum. This offseason and the next couple are going to be weird, and then the league is going to quickly ratify this, as you can tell by my tone, in the last couple of years. like This was a bad mistake, and they're going to start to re like really see the repercussions of it. Um, and I'm just saying that from an entertainment perspective, like you're just losing a lot of the allure of the league here with what they did. It's not going to shock me if one day you end up um, working next alongside Adam Silver and advising him. No, I'm never, baseball. I'm never doing it right no. now. I'll say it right now. I will okay. never work in the league ever. No, ever, never, right. ever. Well, that's, that's never. so I would, if you did it though, sounds... would you still join me on this podcast or would that be like, you have to shut it all down? Yes. And I, I just to explain, because people are like, what are you insane? It just sounds like a lot. <laughs> it just sounds like a lot mentally to handle. And I love basketball, but I have like a relatively, uh, to my standards, sane mental um, acuity with me right now, a concreteness to my mental. And I know how hard those guys grind, man. And I would be grinding even harder than them probably with how much I would want it and how much I would want to help a team win. It would drive me to the point of insanity. I, I wouldn't do it. All right. Well, we'll check back in in a year. But I, I believe you. Not that I don't believe you. I just like to see your basketball mind at work. Um, one uh, one more thing. I think we should put Chris Paul in the Ring of Honor, and I think it should be done while he's playing for what he did for, did for Phoenix. I think next time he's back here, 
Phoenix should do it. Probably won't happen, but it's just food for thought there. Um, other other uh, question for you before you get out of here. Okay, so Cody Williams from Perry High is projected to go potentially to the, the Trailblazers at seven. Another guy we, I don't know if we've talked about him or not, but Deron Holmes from Millennium uh, projected to be a first-round pick. You know, I, I don't think either of those guys would end up with the Suns unless the Suns went and got Holmes and, and, and decided he could be the, you know, rim protector, screen setter, and three-point shooter that we're talking about. But, um you know, we we talked about the French influence, but this draft has a little bit of an Arizona influence as well. I mean, that 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 kind of fires me up as an Arizona. What about you? Yeah, I got a couple cats lingering in the second round. We'll see what happens, Mark. I, I love Kashad Johnson. I'll, I'll talk about him in a second. Cody Williams is one of the few guys, Mark, with what I was talking about with wing and everything, where much like his brother Jalen, just a winning play guy. He's got the Mikel Bridges gene where if you just put him on a basketball court, he is going to impact the game positively and you are going to love it on your team for a very long time. And he seems like one of those surefire bets to the point where the Hawks are working him out. And and this is like a fine number one over, like a fine complimentary role player with upside from more, just like his brother. Don't get me wrong. But he's getting those interviews, apparently, and getting those workouts from all the reporting that's going on out there. But he and Devin Carter of Providence are the two guys to me where – if I'm a GM in that top 10, I'm if I'm high, I'm trying I'm trying to trade down. I do not want to get fired because I took Risa Shea instead of Salon or whatever other French guy. The Dadiet is the other one, I believe, in the 20s. Like there's a million of them. I don't want to get fired because Ron Holland went 17th and he's the best player in this draft. And I took Alex Sar third. Like, I don't want any of that. Trade down to the teens, get to eight or nine or ten, take Cody Williams, take Devin Carter. You'll be okay with it. Deron Holmes, I'd love for the Suns, Mark. I wrote a story on ArizonaSports.com about this where if the Suns want to, which they should, again, go going back to what we were talking about earlier, vertical threat at the rim, vertical threat spacing-wise with the three, he can do both of those things. Is he a little small to be a modern five? He is, but what a modern five is is changing. Nas Reed was more of a power forward kind of looking guy a couple of years ago even with the trajectory of the league. And you look at how he's being used as a five for Minnesota – and how he fits them offensively with what they're doing. I think that Deron Holmes could be their version of that guy. And I really like the fit for him at 22 or even better if they're able to trade down a couple of spots down to where New York is, which is what Sam Bassini had in his latest mock, or down to where Utah is at 29, Minnesota's at 27. Those are the teams keeping an eye on with trading down. Um, but yeah, I, I like the Cats too. Uh, Pell Larson drove me absolutely nuts with some of the mental mistakes that he would make for us, but at the same time has a bunch of NBA attributes and to uh, what I was saying earlier and what you were saying earlier about how wild this draft is. And Kashad Johnson could very well be one of the 10 best players in this draft if he lands in the right spot because of how volatile that the first 20 are going to be. Like It's going to be one of those drafts where if you just got a solid, dependable rotation player for nine seasons, you probably have one of the 10 best players in this class. That could be Kashad. He's 6'8", defense three positions, rebounds, athletic, can shoot. That's all you need. How much will we see you over the G League games? A fair bit. I think it's going to depend on who is playing for them exactly. Fun list. Emmanuel Moutier, is that you? <laughs> Jaleel Okafor. <laughs> Some old friends are back in town. I love it. Um, definitely going to be there. I, I would hope for opening night. I don't know how it's going to blend with the Suns schedule itself. But yeah, catch me a mullet. It'll be great. I think we should find a way to get you on the broadcast. Um, thanks for all the information. Uh, where where can we find your stuff? Draft night, where can we hear you? Where can we see you? And where can we just get more of the beautiful basketball mind that is Kellen Olson? Yeah, ArizonaSports.com is the place to go. That's where you'll find all my writing. Um, I, I love doing the talky talk stuff, especially with you, Mark, but the writing is really what I care about uh, the most. The Empire of the Suns podcast, Kevin and I, Kevin Zerman and I have been doing that for eight years. You want to talk about like the wow, time. we've been doing we've been doing that. For I think a I listened minute. to the first one. I really do. With with Gibby, you remember that? I, idiot? Yes. Oh my. Oh gosh, he would get uh, so angry. Oh my gosh. <laughs> he just <laughs> is still, he okay? By the way, did he just quit. What happened to Gibby? He's doing great. He's rooting on his New York Knicks as best as he can. Yeah. He's doing great right now because the Knicks are good. Like yeah. that that doesn't happen ever. He's doing great. Um, I'm going to be doing some on air stuff too. I'm actually filling in on Burns and Gambo Wednesday through Friday with Dave Burns. So. I'm going to be on the air reacting to the draft on Wednesday and Thursday and uh, podcasts coming, articles coming, all sorts of stuff. And then for agency next week, like I said, I'm going to be in Vegas covering the Olympic stuff, hopefully going to be able to talk to a couple of guys. Maybe I can just go up to Tyrese Halliburton and be like, hey, bud, would you, what happened? 
What happened? Please tell us. I can't wait. You think see tell if I can you? get the intel. Okay. I can't. I can't. You're, you're a guy people tell stuff. So keep keep fighting the good fight for us out there. And uh, yes, we will be. Uh, I'm, I'm going to set it. I think I might have uh, alerts for your tweets, but I'm definitely, if I don't, I'm going to set it right now. And if you're listening out there, you should too. Kellen Olson, everybody. Hey, thanks so much for the time. Yeah, turn on none of these if you want. House of the Dragon thoughts. It. <laughs> I got you. Thanks. This is The Extra Point, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast, sponsored by your Phoenix Suns.